many of us, and this includes me as well at times, have become in, 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 infected by, by the, the disease of, of fear and mistrust. Uh, but, but deep down, I think we all yearn for, uh, for community because our lives become um, much, much richer when we share it with others. Hi, I'm Naomi Mahaffey, and welcome to PAUSE, an Alberta Social Innovation Connect podcast. We invite partners and collaborators to pause from their busy work and sit down together to reflect on what they're learning as they seek to address the root causes of complex problems in their communities. In today's episode, we chat with Glenn Graham and Maiden Mazanel Frank about fostering peace and justice in Alberta. How might we get better at combating violence and injustice in our communities? The Centre for Peace and Justice at Berman University in Lacombe believes that the solution lies in building bridges, not walls, through the use of education and dialogue that engages and respects people across cultural, social, and political differences. Glenn founded the Centre for Peace and Justice three years ago and has been running a variety of programs with the aim of fostering more inclusive and harmonious communities through education and dialogue. Maiden has been part of the Centre's journey as well, contributing her consulting skills and community development knowledge to support the Centre's mission. Elise Martinoski sat down with Glenn and Maiden in Red Deer. This was the first time we had used this particular recording space and equipment, so you may notice a few chair squeaks and other sounds that were more difficult than normal for us to control. Despite that, we came away inspired by the work Maiden and Glenn are doing to foster peace and justice in central Alberta, and we know you will be too. Without further ado, here's their conversation. Hello, and welcome to both of our guests today, Glenn Graham and Maiden Manzanel Frank. We're here today to talk about the Centre for Peace and Justice and how you're seeing peace and justice in central Alberta and beyond. So to get started, could each of you introduce yourselves, who you are, and how you came to be in your role? Hi, I'm Glenn Graham. I'm an assistant professor at Berman University and the director for Centre for Peace and Justice there. Um, uh, I founded the center about three years ago uh, because I saw a real need for peace education in Alberta. Hi, my name is Maiden Mansonel Frank. I'm the founder, CEO, and principal of Global Stakes Consulting. I provide dramatic results for organizations, businesses, nonprofits, and international organizations in Canada and internationally. Uh, I have a lot of international experience that I bring to bear in my work with clients and um, networks and communities. And um, being on this role has given me a tremendous platform to speak, write, engage others in the conversation around innovation, impact, and sustainability. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for both introducing yourselves and thank you for being here today. And now we're going to jump into the change you want to see in your community. Uh, so you can go as big or as small scale as you'd like when you think of the word community. So this could be the neighbors around you, um, which is a smaller scale, the city that you live in, or as large scale as the province, Canada, the world, whatever you'd like. We live in, in a time when the, the politics of, of hate and division has begun to become more and more a part of our of our politics and we've seen an increase in hate crimes both globally and and locally in Alberta as well and uh, reactionary movements are gaining power across the globe and one of the things that fuels this kind of extremism is disinformation and mis and misinformation and coming from an educational institution, I, I thought that one role that we could serve in the community is to uh, be a source for peace through education. That's our mission, to educate for peace, to build community through education, to help uh, bring down those walls of, of misunderstanding between people and allow the people to connect with each other. You're talking about uh, community, and I come from a community development background mm -hmm. uh, internationally as well as in Canada. And I feel that the, the larger conversation of peace and conflict resolution should be connected with development. 
And I think, I believe that a lot of the conflict in the world stems from uh, lack of information, but also lack of power, the lack of ability to create and uh, make decisions about themselves and about their communities, about their lives, uh, a lack of uh, sufficiency in uh, not just in, in, in livelihoods, but also in their ability to negotiate power and negotiate their interests. So they resort to violence, hatred, and apathy. And apathy to me is the worst because if you look at communities that are apathetic, whatever you provide, whatever resources you give, it's always not enough. It's always um, not in the context that they can actually use. So I feel that uh, the conversation around this should be not just be disengaged with other uh, factors, but should be connected with a broader social economic development. And I believe that if you work with communities, you bring them to a place of um, more on the asset, looking at the assets rather than the deficiencies, rather than the incompatibilities, rather than the failures. And that I think is something that you can empower the communities to stand against all these things that are going on uh, in the world. And I feel that you can start somewhere. And mm -hmm. that's my firm belief. Mm -hmm. Wow, those were some great tangible ways uh, we can make the change in our community for peace and justice. Thanks for sharing. And I feel like you both touched upon this already uh, a little bit, but my next question was going to be, how did the Center for Peace and Justice come to be? I think you both shared a lot of great things about what was happening in the community and your response to that, which was creating the center and these programs. But would you like to go into any more detail on how the center came to be and why you decided to create it, what the inspiration was for it? I think uh, Med really touched on something important. We live in a province that has seen an economic downturn. And in that kind of situation, people do feel disempowered. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking a lot about empowerment, right? Yes. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are hurting yeah. and it's easy to look for scapegoats in those kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. And it, it's tempting to look at people who are different than ourselves and blame them for our problems. Um, it's, it's so easy to forget that we share a common humanity and that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's what you're, you're talking about, empowering people to, to, to build community together, to to just and and to see that as a shared vision, instead of dividing people against each other, uh, it's a different kind of empowerment. And so that was the primary goal when we started the Center for Peace and Justice, uh, just a response to what's going on in the world. And just um, putting that into context, um, I was sort of attracted to the Center for Peace and Justice when I heard um, General Romeo Delaire narrated uh, his experience about the Rwanda crisis. Um, I am a student of international politics, and to me, Rwanda was one of those um, shining moments of um, humanitarian failure and the uh, incapacity of global leaders to act uh, based on humanitarian grounds for, for the right reasons. And uh, having him speak led me to believe that I can do more than just hearing it, just, just, just listening to him. And when he said the call to action at the end of the speech was, you have a role to play, you have a voice, you have expertise, you're the community builders here, what are you doing? Where, what are you doing to make the, 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 the community a better place or the world a better place? And I said, I have all the skills I have and I can do more than just sitting here. And I believe when I talked to Glenn about it, I said, oh, I want to be, you know, engaged. I want to be involved. And I think that's the first step towards really building community is you have to step up to the plate. And if we all have the mentality that we can bring in something, contribute something, I think all these things that we're facing right now can be addressed, can be mitigated, and can be prevented. And that social harmony is something that we can design right now, right here in our doorsteps and if we can all work together. So that's the key. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. We love hearing from listeners, and we know there are many incredible things you're doing and learning across our province that we don't have the opportunity to profile on this podcast. Are you working to create meaningful social or environmental change in Alberta? 
Please take a few minutes to share one of your turning points from 2019. How did a new mindset, relationship, approach, or idea change you and or your change-making efforts? Share what you've learned to help us expand our collective wisdom and inspire each other to become more reflective, creative, and impactful in our change-making efforts. Your story will be included in a compilation of Turning Point stories from others across the province, and it will help us uncover patterns and stories we may want to feature in future blog posts, podcasts, and events. Learn more by going to www.abcconnect.ca. And now, back to the conversation. You brought in a very uh, key point there, made in around working together, and that that is a very pivotal point to do work well. Uh, and I assume that there's lots of this community building and working together in the programs you've developed in response to your mission statement, uh, which is to promote inclusive and harmonious communities that respect the rights and dignities of all through education and dialogue. Can you share some examples of ways you're promoting inclusive and harmonious communities through education and dialogue work? All our uh, programs are aimed at breaking down these walls of fear and misunderstanding between people and to build uh, community through education. Um, so we have a lecture series, the one that Romeo Dallaire spoke at when, when he came to yes. to our community. Uh, it's called the Her Lectures. Uh, we draw large audiences from across yes. central Alberta and beyond. Um, our goal in these lecture series is to get beyond ideology, to get beyond the politics of left and right, mm-hmm. uh, to bring speakers together, who, who to bring speakers in who can bring people together around issues that really matter to us as a community. Um, These are issues that ought to unite us uh, because they're about our common humanity and our common future, our shared destiny and the future of our planet. Um, We also operate uh, a workshop bureau uh, and that is focused on, that workshop bureau is focused on conflict transformation training Uh, The Bureau links some of our best local uh, conflict resolution facilitators with local organizations. And we we gear these uh, training workshops uh, towards smaller organizations that normally wouldn't have the budget, the the, the HR budget, to to do this kind of professional development. Um, So we we specialize in workshops for small businesses, for churches, for non-profits. Um, then we have a, a program called Peace Builders, which is a youth leadership program in, running currently in Red Deer. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a program that brings youth, youth together for a series of uh, workshops and dialogues with various local community organizations. And, and these dialogues are tremendously eye-opening for the students because they're introduced, they introduce students uh, to parts of our community that might that they might not normally interact with. Um, and so we've seen tremendous growth in these students as they begin to learn more about their, their own community and the people who live in it and how diverse their community is and, and how many people out there there are who, who are doing good things on behalf of the community and making a difference. Um, so they enter into the dialogue with these uh, diverse groups and organizations and um, based on these dialogues, uh, they do a needs assessment of the community, and then they um, then they produce a call to action uh, based on that assessment. Um, some of the last year's group uh, met with local government officials, including the mayor, a Red Deer, and they're slated now to present to city council. On their on their rec- most recent proposal, uh, which is and that call to action is a is a call to form a youth advisory council uh, for the city of Red Deer, and this is this would be a, a way of for the youth youth to gain a voice in local in local politics. And then the last project that we're engaged with is the Interfaith Network, uh, which is currently collaborating with the Red Deer. Um, welcoming and inclusive communities network uh, and we we aim to build uh, understanding between uh, various faith groups in the city that's that's the mission of that organization mm-hmm. 
Wow, that is a lot of work uh, that the Centre is doing that you're doing, Glenn, and I know Maiden, you're a part of it as well. It's very inspiring. And uh, Glenn gave a really good intro and background on the programs. Is there anything that you wanted to add to that, Maiden? Yes, um, a couple of things, actually. So I collaborate with the Centre for Peace on uh, one committee, and it's called the Community Reconciliation Committee, it's CRC. And uh, it stands for Community Reconciliation because that's the overall uh, goal of the committee is to um, we strive for community reconciliation. I mean, it's all these things that are happening in the world, in our community, and create an enabling environment for uh, community members to come together and share and really know each other, not just um, know them by name, but really know and understand each other and uh, respect and engage that humanity that is around us. Uh, I just want to make a clarification that um, to us, there are two kinds of conflict. Um, if you look at conflict resolution and conflict um, prevention, um, there are two kinds of conflict. One is the positive conflict that comes from diversity of humanity. And the second conflict is the negative conflict. And this comes with, uh, because of diversity, um, there is a tendency for people to um, to act out in, in a violent, non-humane way. And I feel that in our committee, we'd like to have um, a, a great um, diversity and a great uh, sharing of, of different um, experiences. And I feel that that's a positive, um, that's a positive way to bring um, innovation and um, creativity into the fore if you have diverse voices. And it may clash at some point, but at the end of the day, it's a cooperative conflict that works. What we're seeing right now is the, the downside acting out in, in violence and, and harming other people uh, by uh, trying to manipulate or uh, dominate the conversation around your own self, very, very self-centered uh, conversations or interactions. And in our committee, conflict transformation is really about not just prevention, but transform the conflict in a positive way where people really understand each other, communicate very well and articulate their interest. Uh, looking at themselves and, and the larger interest of, of the community. And I think that's what we started looking at those issues. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that I work with many communities, not just with the center. So I bring, a, I bring in a very different perspective. And in my work with the networks such as, you know, housing community, the house, the health community, uh, even the food innovation networks that I'm currently in, they all have different um methods of arriving at it, but they all want empowerment. They all want the ability to, to, to um, create impactful work in the community, in their spheres of influence and in their networks. And I feel that we're talking of the same thing, just with different, there's a lot of silo that goes on. And I feel that if there's more cooperation and there's more collaboration with different um, networks and communities, we can build better societies. We can build better systems and we can impact a larger group of people. And I feel that that's something that I personally would like to do is to break down those silos of, you know, of just working in your network, just working in your organization and try to look at the larger results of what you're trying to achieve and bring in other people that go with you that are passionate enough and to, to, to build bridges, not, um, divide divide people but build more bridges so that other people can go with you and can travel with you in in a very good um, in a better destination are there any particular ways or approaches that you've taken to combat that tension you just explained there that you can share with us i think it's really about education and engagement um people have their own um biases and um ideas about what the lifestyle they want to have. And if it contradicts them, they try to, you know, retreat from it. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's really about what can you, they do right now with the resources that they have, with the expertise that they have, and become part of a greater community. And uh, the fact that a lot of people retreat and go back to the woods or go back to their own, their own comfort zones do not help at all. Right. And the more you uh, give... Um, people a chance to participate, that's that's more value overall for the community. And I guess we have to be creative in ways to engage different kinds of people, different kinds of abilities, different kinds of resources, 
um, um, as and different kinds of assets. Um, if we have that ability to engage them, then we can find that even a young child can help, even a, a young adult can help, even a senior citizen can help in so many ways. And that is something I think seem to be um, facing a lot of a lot of times. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, when you, you talk about that, that um, education as a, as a way of doing that and and retreating into our own silos and and yeah. and, and since we're, we're, we're creatures of, of comfort and we want to Just to stay where we're comfortable. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the reasons we we do that is also because I think that a lot of people today are skeptical of education, too, and and that education can actually make a real difference in the world um that it can actually change people's hearts and, and minds um education is also seen as elitist sometimes these days um and uh, it's so there are a lot of barriers even to get you know people out to to an event an, a lecture yes. event for example because there's uh, everything is politicized as well you know, uh, um, our work is often seen as liberal in an area that's predominantly conservative, um, and that's a that's a, actually a misunder that's a misunderstanding. I, I don't think our work is liberal or conservative. It's it's no. it's something I think that's beyond beyond that. And we try to we try to uh, we try to emphasize that, um, but nevertheless, that's that's a challenge. Um, to get beyond the skepticism of education, uh, which is seen as elitist sometimes, to um, get beyond our, our silos, uh, get beyond our prejudices and misunderstandings. Another issue is because there's so much information out there on Facebook, on, on, on various social media, people are getting information all the time. And, and it's hard to differentiate between good and bad information. And there's a skepticism of that, even you know that's elitist in itself to, to think that there is such a thing as good and bad and necess- good and bad information. But um, that's another barrier that we have to overcome when we're in terms of education. There's so much information, and there's so much bad and disinformation out there, and, and that's also contributing towards these divisions that, that I've been talking about. Um, because there's so much skepticism of other people in our in our communities, uh, people that we're not familiar with, that we don't, that we don't think that we have common ground with, um, this is the kind of thing that's dividing us as well as as communities and creating these barriers that 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 Med is talking about. And this is um, true even for a city like Red Deer. Our communities are becoming richer and more diverse, and we could draw on that all those experiences of of these diverse people who have come to our communities. Uh, but instead it's the, this, we often ignore that. We don't see that. We don't see the diversity as a strength. Um, we see it as a, as a kind of weakness sometimes. And, and that's another challenge that we've, we've had to overcome. It's been very powerful, uh, to hear the two of you talk about the power of education. Education is our grounding. That's our foundation to almost everything. And you brought up that sometimes we forget how powerful the tool of education can be. So that's just wonderful. Yeah, I've, I've seen I've seen people's hearts and minds change through education mm-hmm. once they you know op- open up to uh, perspectives that they've never uh, encountered before. And, and people, if they, and this mostly includes face to face communication with people mm-hmm. and perspectives that they've never encountered before. It's not abstract. It's not just about ideas. It's about meeting people, meeting new people. Mm-hmm. It's about creating opportunities for, for dialogue, face-to-face dialogue. Mm-hmm. That, that's what we try to do. Yeah. And the relationship, too, that comes yes. from that. Like yeah. Seeing people and talking to them and hearing their story. Yeah. 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 Really yeah. build a relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, and, that, and we also have to remember that that's a challenge for all of us. It's mm-hmm. not, we don't speak about those people out there who need education. Education is something for all of us. We all need to uh, confront our own biases and our own perceptions uh, that goes for our work you know for the, for our organization within our organization um, education is for everyone
just going to add up to that, that uh, there's a saying that um, violence starts in the mind and peace starts in the mind. So you understand that it's really a mindset mm -hmm. and a change of behavior and change of attitude and um, perceptions about what peace is about and what violence is about and how you can start from, you know, start educating a young person to understand how he can be a peaceful force in the world rather than an obstacle to community building. Yeah. I just want to expand on, we're, we're talking about conflict and tensions and challenges. Let's, let's look at the, the positive lens. Mm -hmm. What about positive peace? Mm -hmm. Because peace is always couched in the context of absence of war or conflict. But let's def redefine it in a different way. Re let's redefine it in a positive way. That mm -hmm. peace comes with all these great things that we have in the community. Mm -hmm. Belonging, harmony, empowerment, mm -hmm. um, socioeconomic well-being. Um, greater autonomy and independence in terms of decision making of those that are you know affected by the issue um, a good governance these are all components of what positive peace is all about and uh, I think our the next step for us as a center for peace and also as a peace scholar is to really drive down the point that we can create positive peace right here Mm -hmm. Why we uh, mitigate conflict and uh, resolve conflict and prevent conflict and transform conflict into positive peace. Let's also look at positive peace as a in, in a proactive way by educating, informing, and engaging people about what are the components of positive peace right here in our community as well as at, at a global scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, I, that. yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, human rights are important and we need to stand up for the rights of, of all people. Uh, but I think we have to go beyond that, which is why we talk about building community. I don't believe in a radical kind of free freedom, uh, this a kind of ideology that tells people that they just need to look out for themselves. Um, you know, this kind of ideology that, that by, divides people against each other. I'm, uh, I'm much more conservative than that. Uh, because I believe in, in community. Uh, we, we all share a common humanity. Um, and while human rights are important, and uh, we do need to, and we, while we do need to protect the freedoms of, of all people, I don't think it's enough just to say that uh, each, every, we all need our freedom to do our own thing. We need to go the extra step and actually build community. Um, we need to bring people together to learn from each other and, and, and grow from each other. And, and I think that's, that's what, um, and so I agree with Med, that's I think what that positive vision is, is all about. We, we need to start with human rights. Uh, we need to protect the, our freedoms, but then we have to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, peace is just the absence of war, that's like you right. say. Yeah. Which is, yeah. It is delimiting us from mm -hmm. accomplishing great things. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you brought in that point to made in that most of the challenges and tensions we face are fairly often negative challenges. I mean, there's always good challenges too, um, but I'm glad you brought in the importance of focusing on the positive side as well. Uh, and on pause, we like to end on a positive note. So to wrap up our conversation, uh, as you think about the future, what are you most hopeful for, for your work or your community as you look ahead? I think love is, is, is ultimately stronger than hate. Uh, hate is based on, on illusions. Hate is an illusion, it, but love is eternal. It can't die. Um, and so we just, we just need to provide opportunities for people to connect with each other. And then, and then love will draw us out of ourselves and, and allow us to grow as a community. Um, many of us, and this includes me as well at times, have become in, in, in infected by by the, the disease of, of fear and mistrust. Uh, but but deep down, I think we all yearn for uh, for community because our lives become um, much much richer when we share it with others. When we learn to see the world through the eyes of others, I think I think we all yearn to connect with others in that way. We long for that richness, for for that diversity in in harmony and in harmony in the in diversity. It's a it's a fundamental uh, human need that I believe will win out in the end. Mm -hmm. That's a 
that's a great great way to end it actually but i'm just gonna add a few things um talk about love and and against uh, hate which is uh, based on fear and fear is a very negative but very powerful emotion and fear can drive you to many things in in dark places so i think that uh we need to have love that's that's the deepest and most essential uh, d- drive that can draw us out of that and connect us with other human being, but at the same time we also need to have courage, the courage to stand up for for uh, for our communities and for the kinds of things that we want to achieve. Because without courage, we can't be faithful, we can't be powerful, we can't we can't be effective, we can't be um, uh, creative. So it, it it always comes, it always requires a certain kind of courageous leadership. And when we started with the center, I believe it was Glenn who just started it. Just himself at, at the very beginning with some really passionate people. And, you know, Margaret Mead said, um, with a with a group of people, you can change the world. And, and, it, it, and I think it's, it's really, it's really true. Mm-hmm. So if you have a group of really courageous leaders, I think that there, there we have a lot of solutions instead of challenges. Just to add to what Med said, I would, I want to recognize the, the network of volunteers that, that, oh, yes, that works on behalf yes. of the center mm-hmm. uh, across Central Alberta. I think that's that's, that's the most important thing is is that network that that we've created. Um, um, it's it's not about one person doing no. doing everything. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's actually half the work in itself is just to bring people together mm-hmm. to work on behalf of the community. Again, thank you both so much for being here, for taking the time out of your day. This was such an inspiring conversation, hearing about the challenges you faced and the work you're doing in the community to create peace and justice and understanding and bringing humans together. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of PAUSE. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that the Centre for Peace and Justice is located on Treaty 6 territory, and our conversation with Maiden and Glenn was recorded at Red Deer College on Treaty 7 territory. We acknowledge the past, present, and future generations of First Nations and Métis peoples who have traditionally gathered in and cared for the land we now know as Central Alberta. Land steeped in ceremony and history that until relatively recently was used exclusively by Indigenous peoples. This episode was produced by Alberta Social Innovation Connect, or ABSI Connect. You can learn more about our network, find our newsletter, and get inspired by and connected to other changemakers by visiting our website, www.absiconnect.ca. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us out by sharing it with a friend and rating us on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. We'd also love to hear your feedback and reflections on this show and your ideas for future episodes. Our funding partner is the Suncor Energy Foundation. This episode was recorded and edited by Elise Martinowski of Absi Connect. Theme music was created by the Fort McMurray Youth of the Soundforce Collective. <laughs>